we get started with the, the foot and ankle session, I'm one of the foot and ankle surgeons here, but you've heard enough of me this last two days. So I'm going to turn it over to my partners. First up, we have uh, Joe Park. He, he's been here for four, 13, 13 years. He's our division head. Um, he's sort of led the whole charge for our division growth. And he's going to talk to us about open Achilles tendon repair. Um, Achilles tendon is an interesting topic for, I think most of us will deal with that or whether you do foot and ankle or not, you'll see patients who have one or, you know, you may be asked, should I have this done open? Should I do it percutaneously? And so he's going to talk about open Achilles tendon repair. All right. Thanks, Drew. All right. I'm going to, I was told to go fast, so I'm going to try to get this done in the right time. Okay. okay. Perfect. So those are my disclosures. So, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to be one of the team physicians for UVA and we've had a lot of success as everyone in this room knows. Um, but I just, I put this slide up because, you know, we talk about mental health and this day was one of the roughest days of my entire life, I would say. So the, we care for all of our athletes, but the shooter actually was one of my patients. And I haven't really told everybody this, but I fixed him, got him back to football, but he ended up not playing. And, and on the day that this happened, I didn't, we didn't exactly know what was happening. We got a text message for all the sports doctors saying this was the person Dr. Park had fixed him on this day. Several, it was like six years ago at that point. And um, I, I didn't know what to do. So I called the police and I said, this is what happened. I don't know if it has anything to do with me, but if you guys could send a, a car just to watch my area, you know, I have three kids and we're home right now. So that was, that was a rough day. And, but, you know, also, you know, these are all young men that, and women who are not just athletes, they're, they're future parents and leaders and all that. So I was asking them like what they're studying, what they're going to do, what their goals are, not just where they're from and what position they play, but try to get to know them. So, um, as Truett said, we're going to talk about Achilles tendon rupture. I think this is a really important topic because all of you guys will have a friend or family member who does this. I, I guarantee it. Um, it's increasing. So in from 2012 to 16, the incidence increased from 1.8 to 2.5 per 100,000 person years. It's definitely still a male predominance, 3.5 to 1. The mean age is male 38, female 36, which is way younger than me, which is very humbling. Actually, Bobby used to see me. I was still playing in the Premier League for the for Soka, and I, he'd see me because he'd be dropping off his kids, and he'd say, "Joe, you're going to rupture your Achilles." So thanks for that. <laughs> so I did ended up stop playing, but the biggest increase is in the 40 to 59 year year group. I think we're trying to stay active later. Sports accounts for 81.9 percent of ruptures, and of those ruptures, 42.6 are from basketball. So. There are many different ways to fix it. One of our mentors, Dr. Clinton, published this paper. But if you look at open repair, that has definitely has less elongation than all these kind of percutaneous approaches that you can see here on the right. The Acalon, PARS, and the speed bridge are ways that you just kind of pass suture through little stab wounds, and then you dock it or suture it into the distal tendon. And of note, you know, most elongation occurred early in the first 10 cycles. The failure is almost always at the suture tendon interface, which those of us who have to do tendon repair, we understand why that's the case. Um, this, is a, this is a cool uh, study they did, but you know, I wrote here, not everyone is Bob Anderson. I had to debate him on why open was better than percutaneous repair. Bob Anderson's one of the pioneers and godfathers of foot and ankle surgery. But if you look at these um, ultrasound studies looking at where they put these needles, they, they missed very frequently. So only 45% were, were placed properly, 55% were wrong and they reposition them. And really it's the lateral needles, mostly because maybe people are trying to miss the sural nerve. Another study looked at ultrasound um, and they adjusted it if it was wrong. And they looked at MRI with ultrasound, 87.2% healed without only 66% healed. They had higher AOFAS scores with ultrasound, earlier healing, earlier return to sport, and only two transient hyperesthesias in the no ultrasound group. Obviously a little longer OR time for the ultrasound group. And there was their technique. So this is the technique I have used for many years, but um, I had to give credit to my friend and partner, Dr. Dacus, because he wrote it up when he was a resident, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Sure. Yes. Okay. So this is a cool technique. It's, four, it's a four-strand repair, but you don't tie the knot in the, re, in the rupture. You tie it proximal and distal. So you get a four-strand repair, so it's twice as strong, but, and also you don't have suture material in the rupture. There's a picture of a shark. Uh, so that, this is my techniques. So I make an incision kind of on the medial side of the tendon. You can see here, 
the intact plant terrace that we that we you see right there to help with your attention. I repaired using it using Richard's gift box technique and has worked very, very well in my career. Now I've tried other techniques. This is the docking technique. This is the sural nerve. Believe it or not, it looks that big in this particular patient. Um, but you make a small incision at the side of the rupture, and then you grab the suture with a suture uh, tendon with suture tape, and you dock it into the bone, so you're not worried about pull out. Um, I've had some issues. I'll talk about that briefly. But for me, you know, I, this is a case case on that side right there left. I'm doing a Z lengthening for a, a patient who had a stroke. I'm trying to lengthen his tendon. I started doing these bilaterally, just Z lengthening them, letting them externally rotate. Here are the post-op um, results, but you can see my incisions are kind of medial uh, off the tendon, like that. So here's, I'm gonna just go through some quick examples. So here's a 22 year old collegiate basketball player. You can see, you, you don't have to make a huge incision. I try to grab the suture, uh, the, with the suture, grab the tendon. I don't like to use clamps or Kelly clamps. I think it destroys the tissue worse than it already is. So I try to use the suture to grab it. And then I use that technique. Here's a 28 year old former basketball player who's now an investment banker, same technique. That's what that looks like. And here's a tougher case. So this is a, a 45 year old, that's how old uh, I am right now. So to me, that seems young, but at the same time, very old. <laughs> unfortunately for myself. But um, this was a case I was thinking of treating non-operatively and I got an ultrasound and interestingly, it showed that the, there was quite a big gap, about 3.4 centimeters at neutral and it did not really improve with plantar flexion. And so I felt that this would do better with surgery and that's what I did for him. And he ended up doing very, very well with this technique. So here's that docking technique that we were talking about. Um, again, you make a small incision, grab the suture, the, grab the tendon proximally with the suture tape, and then do a suture lasso to pass it through the distal tendon. Then you maximally plantar flex, and you dock the suture into the calcaneus through a separate incision. And I've liked this technique. This is this is one of our uh, football running backs. I like a 19 year old kid. I had to do it for. Did quite well as well. However, I've had a few of these patients have continued heel pain. You can see on this MRI, he had some edema in the calcaneus, and I just couldn't get it to get better. And so I've sort of stopped doing this technique. I kind of do the one I showed you. So quickly, I'll go through some kind of weird cases. Uh, this is a 57-year-old physical therapist. He'd had his Achilles repair done 20 years ago on the same side. And he told me a story that he, you know, shortly after the surgery, he felt a pop, and then he couldn't really use it, that was actually, that was 20 years ago. And then he had the same thing happen, you know, a week before I saw him. So he had a, a positive Thompson's thickened Achilles. And on the MRI, interestingly, there's only a little bit of edema kind of right at the rupture site. And that's not typically what you would see in an acute rupture. And I took him to the OR and what you can see is that his proximal tendon was completely scarred to the posterior fascia and there was zero excursion, okay? This is after I had freed up that tendon on the right. You can see that the tendon is quite hypertrophic. And here's what the reconstructed tendon looks like. Interestingly, he actually is doing better now than he's ever done in the past two decades because now his calf is actually working. So he's quite happy. Here's another weird case, central avulsion. So this is kind of an insertional tendinopathy and the central part of the tendon, most of the tendon had ruptured. Um, and here you can see there's the MRI with that large gap right there in the watershed area. Carefully, you know, removed these bone fragments, did the Haglund's excision. Um, and you can see you try to, I try to save as much tendon as possible. Then I grab the suture. You can see that black suture tape. I grab proximal to the rupture and pass the sutures distal. Here we're doing a conventional second, secondary reconstruction where you use suture anchors and a double row reconstruction. And what, what, what I did was ran the blue suture, which is from the secondary reconstruction up, and I ran the black suture down, and that looks like this. And then I docked it into the second row uh, with some push locks, and that's what it looked like reconstructed. <coughs> All right, so these are, these are not my cases. These are actually cases from Dr. Marty O'Malley from HSS, who I, during the debate, I just wanted to see if there were some examples. He had of failed PARS techniques. So he sent me these, actually he sent me a bunch of cases, but these are the two that he wanted me to focus on. But this is a 28 year old guy, had a PARS uh, 
procedure done, eight weeks post-op. You can see the incision, tiny little incisions, but the tendon re-ruptured. And so for this, he used an autograft. I don't think I have the guts to do an autograft in a professional uh, football player, but that's what he did. That's his hamstring out autograft, and then he wraps the tendon in, the, in a human dermal matrix. Here's a 25-year-old NFL player, seven weeks post-op, same problem. He was able to repair it primarily, and then he wraps it with this uh, acellular dermal matrix. So post-op, I splint them for two weeks in 20 degrees of plantar flexion, non-weight bearing. I try to keep them off it for another two to three weeks with a boot and two wedges. So about 20 degrees of plantar flexion. It's really important that you begin early plantar flexion active at two weeks, or really what is important is that the wound is healed. Um, and I do let them actively dorsiflex and dor I begin active dorsiflexion trying to keep them 10 degrees shy of neutral. And the big key to this is you don't wanna bring them up past dorsiflexion to neutral too quickly. So for me, I wanna get them to neutral by eight weeks and maybe five degrees beyond by 10 weeks. Single stance heel rise, a lot of therapists, they, this is, they focus on this. I don't really care if they do that um, or not, but at five to six months is when I would expect that at the earliest. There's a pretty good study showing that return to sport can take six to 10 months. And it's almost the same exact protocol for non-op uh, so that's, that's pretty much the same exact protocol minus the surgery. So in athletes, you know, Achilles ruptures can be very devastating. Only 76% of athletes return in professional sports. The NFL says 72 and a half. That's the second worst injury only behind patellar tendon rupture. Linemen return most of the time, 75%. Skilled players, only 53%. They do tend to re-rupture if they do within two years, 12 out of 80. The NBA showed a 71% return. Professional soccer, actually, interestingly, much higher return to play, but it still took almost a year. So all of them had decreased playing time, less games, less minutes across NFL, NBA, and professional soccer. Um, surgical versus non-surgical, this was a good study in 2012, just a meta-analysis. And if you use early functional rehab, starting early range of motion, the re-rupture rate is almost identical between surgical and non-surgical. If you stop or delay the range of motion, <laughs> excuse me, surgery will uh, decrease the risk of re-rupture by about 8.8%, but there's obviously a much higher risk of complications. Surgery, they did get back to work a little earlier, 19.16 days, but there's no difference in calf circumference or size. This is a, re a very recent study uh, out of Norway, multi-center randomized control, 526 patients, Average BMI is not really like our country, but the average BMI in this study was 27. Uh, over 60% were ASA1, but they did not find any difference in uh, the Achilles tendon total rupture score at 12 months. Re-rupture was higher in the non-op patients, 6.2, which I think is in, on par with what's in the literature too. And they did have a slightly higher risk of nerve injury with percutaneous. Half of all re-ruptures occurred within 10 weeks after initial injury. So in conclusion, open repair works very well if you can avoid wound complications. Um, in my experience, be very wary of post-steroid injection Achilles rupture. Um, maybe we should I should treat these non-op. I've had infections and bad outcomes with that setting. Um, and if you do use percutaneous techniques, you have to practice. Blood flow restriction, these are things that I'm not sure about, but a lot of people, professional athletes, undergo blood flow restriction. When do you do an FHL transfer? I almost never do them anymore. And then other augmentation things. So for just for the audience, you know, if you see a big gap, the question is, you know, when, how big of a tendon gap is okay for non-op treatment? I use one centimeter, one and a half centimeters. There's no real great literature for that. So this is our division. You're going to hear from Dr. Paramol and Dr. Tippett. You guys know Dr. Cooper. I put Shep up here in our PAs, but, you know, Shep has helped us with the research and, you know, hopefully he'll play an even bigger role going forward. All right. Thank you, guys. Any questions about Achilles? Okay. Yep. Right. So now, I think with ultrasound, if it looks, if it is a more proximal rupture, it works beautifully to do it supine. Often the setup takes longer than the case for an Achilles if you do it prone. Um, so I, I've been doing, if it's a isolated watershed primary rupture, I'll do it supine. 
if I'm worried about the insert, like those other weird cases, if I'm worried about the insertion, I'm worried about a recurrent tear, I'll do it prone just so I have all the options to do other things. Yeah. Both. I think it's both. Yeah. He's worried about the structure. I don't know if you do an allograft. I'm not sure you have to do autograft. I'm not sure you have to do that, but that's his preference. So. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But Marty takes care of the majority of all NBA players. So um, he, he, he's helped me with a lot of tough cases and things like that. Yes. You're doing not all. Just use the boot as well for that, or do you have a special version? You know, there is this boot called the Backo Pen. It's a, it's a German boot that adjusts. It's pretty amazing. It's like, but it's about three hundred dollars. It's actually far more comfortable. If I ruptured my Achilles, I would buy that. Um, the wedges are tricky because they can come with little tiny wedges or these big ones that we have downstairs. But I try to aim for like fifteen degrees of plantar flexion. Just a boot. In a boot, correct. But I'll, I try to keep them off it. Acute rupture, maybe two or three weeks, usually is good. Yeah. Just avoid bringing them up too fast. Yeah. <laughs> usually not. I just I just did a case with Bartolon, which is the synthetic, and that was just because her tendon was so horrible. And you know, like I said, I always have the FHL as backup if I need it, but Bartolon, I think, might be a good. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thanks. Good. Yeah. So next, uh, our partner, then Cap Dermal, is going to talk to us about this metatarsal fracture, particularly the Jones-type fractures. Uh, he's been here 10 years, so he's been here longer than me as well. Um, he did his fellowship here before that. And so 10 years, right? <laughs> 10 years since 2013. But uh, yeah, he's going to talk to us about Jones fracture. Tell us how to solve the ball. Thanks. I'm changing. It's the green button. I, I yeah. Well, let's change uh, the gears a little bit from uh, Achilles tendon to, to Jones fracture. Um, first of all, I thank the, the Dr. Botney, Dr. Cooper, and Dr. Shabrov to, to organize such a good, a good program, beautiful program. Um, and I also thank the alumni who took time from the busy schedule to be here, you know, to, you know, uh, for this conference. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about, you know, how to fix a Jones fracture or, you know, what, how to treat, but uh, we are trying to, you know, like uh, what's new in the past couple of years in the Jones fracture in high level athletes. Uh, this is the foot ankle, uh, you know, uh, division for a recent uh, picture. Um, no disclosure. So we all know that, you know, like Jones fracture is common in, um, you know, jumping and, you know, sudden changes uh, direction in horse surface, you know, in, in sports. Um, the objective of this uh, talk is to understand about Jones fracture in athletes and then what has changed, if at all there is any, uh, to treat Jones fracture in, in athletes in the past few years. So this, this, this slide shows, you know, like the uh, database from, you know, like uh, published in 2017, uh, for about 220 athletes, they did a retrospective study, and then they, the top three sports are basketball, football, and soccer. Depending upon which journal you see, it could be first could be football or basketball. But overall, you know, like uh, the top three sports are basketball, football, and soccer. Um, what do we know so far in Jones fractures? You know, athletes. You know, like anatomy. Uh, we know the anatomy that has not changed forever. And then the injury pattern, we know sports, you know, like depending upon what, what sports you play, the way they, 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 they fracture their foot, proximal foot metatarsal. Um, treatment, we all know that, you know, like uh, for athletes, we used to be surgery, put them back to, uh, to, to sports. And return to sports varies. It depends upon, you know, like which sports uh, their, the athletes are, you know, playing. So we all know about Jones fractures a little bit uh, a tougher fracture to treat because of this anatomy and the blood supply to that the, the area where the fracture happens is not good. So yeah. healing is a problem, delayed healing, delayed healing is a problem, non-union is a problem as well. But unlike athlete, uh, Achilles tendon rupture, most of the, uh, the, the high level athletes who have this zone fracture, they get back to sports pretty quick. 
right with treatment. Um, what what has changed in the past few years, if at all there is any, right? Is there any non-operative role? That's one thing you know we always talk about. Second thing is what about surgery? You know what what implant? Is there any change in the implant we use? Um, and what about the augments? Uh, the by, by augments I talk uh, I, I mentioned that is it, it could be autograph, it could be allograph, it could be bone marrow aspirate or DBX. Is there any change in return to play? What are the failure rates? And is there any way to prevent these fractures from happening, right? So these are things, you know, like uh, when I was preparing this talk, these are the couple points, you know, like I was thinking about. So, so let's talk about non-operative management, non-surgical management. This is a um, study, you know, it came out of 2020 recently, like two years back. They looked into, you know, like um, 793 athletes. This is a, a meta-analysis where most of, was, most of them was observational studies, few randomized controlled trials. And they, they concluded that, you know, like there's a high rate of bone healing and low risk of non-union compared to conservative management. I've been said that, you know, like non-athlete, non they usually, you know, they recommend six to eight weeks of, you know, like cast, non-weight bearing, and they did have a pretty good union rate uh, with the non-operative as well. But for athletes, they, they said that, you know, like they have a very high success rate with bone healing and low risk of non-union in surgery. Second thing, what's new in surgery, right? You know, we all know that, you know, surgery gets back them to, uh, to play, you know, quicker. Uh, is there any change in the, in the way we treat this patient on screws, plates, whatever? So this is a, another article that came out in 20, last year, a year before. Um, they, sorry, um, they published and they said that internal fixation of screw was the, the best option. And most of them, you know, return to play was roughly about eight to 12 weeks, depending upon the sports um, after surgery. So as for the recent articles, you know, like the past two, three years, still most of them are using screws for fixation. Is there any change in type of the implant for fixation, right? So is there any, you know, like we, we all know that screws, you know, is the way to go and then we'll be doing it for, for you know, how long? Is there any change with your screws? You know, tan latest screws was a solid screws. A um, couple of years back, you know, like there was an article talks about, you know, like screw, you know, solid, and then, you know, like tan latest screws. Um, most of the time, you know, it, it's, it's the outcome was the same. Return to play, time to return to play, and healing was the same. Uh, but the healing was a little bit better in a solid screw. Plate versus screw, that's another debate. Most of them, we don't use plates, you know, like in an acute setup where in an acute um, fracture fixation in a Jones fracture because of the plate issue, you have to open the fracture, debride the fracture, and then, you know, like it's, uh, it takes long to long time to heal. But in a revision setup, meaning that if it's a non-union or, you know, if you have a broken screw, then it's a different animal where you go, the, where you go open it up, debride it, and put the plate in. So as far as the primary repair of the Jones fracture, that has not changed. Is there any new in return to play? You know, you, you fix these athletes and then they get back, get back to return, you know, get back to sports while they're playing. So a couple, two years back, you know, the International Olympic Committee, you know, like they, they got, you know, surgeons, you know, sports surgeons throughout the world. And uh, they talked about return to play. What what should be the rehab for the athletes? And they came up with a six stage six stage return to play protocol. Um, and this was published in uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine two years back. And what they what they they came up with this you know like this the uh, stage one stage two to stage six is pretty much the same what we do now. It's not much change, but they came up with the consensus and then they they. International committee, they they published this, but it's pretty much the same. You know, I, I asked uh, my mentors and the partners that well, is there any change with the, the rehab? There's nothing much, you know, change. But the committee came up with this. I just wanted to show this because of the International Olympic Committee recently came up with this consensus on how to rehab the athletes before they get back to sports. 
is there any prevention you know is there any, something new in preventing these fractures right you know we talked about we talk about the morphology of the foot we talk about the morphology of the fracture morphology of the metatarsal is there any new in the past couple of years to prevent these fractures so there are a couple of you know like a, a papers we talked about you know how to prevent overall foot fractures you know by focusing on neuromuscular control balance agility training which could reduce the foot and ankle injuries in athletes but nothing specific to the jones fracture but there are a couple articles which you know they are trying to figure out why this fracture happens how could we prevent it can we prevent this fracture from custom orthotics if we have a deformity of the proximal uh, 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 deformity of the proximal fifth metatarsal bone so they're trying to figure out what is there anything that, that they could do to prevent this athlete from having this uh, this fracture this is one of this paper recent recent article um, um, they uh, hypothesized that you know the, there's a significant load on the lateral aspect of the foot uh, during this athletic activity and they they did come up with there is a increased peak pressure mean pressure and maximum force on the on the base of the fifth metatarsal in this in the in the athletes this, this is another paper you know like uh, they they looked into the patho anatomy of this uh, jones fracture in male soccer um, university players and 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 they did a little bit of more digging into this and they mapped the the the, the foot and and this one was a control trial meaning that the 60 feet were in, uh, a patient of the, of the athletes who had deformities and 60 of them they did, they did all of them had some deformity in the base of the fifth metatarsal half of them had fractures half of them did not so they are trying to figure out what what what's going on here and they they concluded that the long fifth metatarsal and the high arch is the reason why you know like they had they are they are this fracture so this is the way they 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 did the study they mapped the foot you know, with the uh, with multiple points the first metatarsal all the metatarsal head all the mtp joint midfoot hind foot and then they took the pressure measurement and mapped the system and if you see that closely uh, on the outside of the foot on the on the outside of the foot this is the foot you know like like the outside of the foot they are all you know where jones striker had increased pressure so they they also they also talk about in their article regarding you know like yes there's a increase in peak pressure increase in pressure on the lateral aspect of the uh, of the of the foot which is the re which might be the reason for jones fracture this is another article um uh, this was done with uh, with nfl uh, nfl uh, participants nfl combine um they did 96 feet uh, fracture was present in 15 feet um these there are two reviewers which looked into this uh, morphology of the of the of the foot and what they did was they did an x-ray ap lateral and oblique view and these are the parameters they they were they were looking into so i'm not going to do this all these parameters but the ap lateral oblique they're trying to you know come up with with some evidence or something to say what well, these foot and have fractures you know these morphology changes whatever you know is to how can we prevent this um they also they came up with the you know the conclusion was metatarsus adductus meaning that all the metatarsal was in like this long straight narrow fifth metatarsal are the cause or the mostly the cause of the reason and they in their in their uh, in the paper talk about mod foot, footwear modification insert modification orthos modification and also told that it is not all jones fracture can be prevented so morphology plays a big role but uh, to be honest we do not know you know really orthotics are really helping or not but still we do orthotics this is another study i'm not going to go through this the same study same thing, long proximal, uh, proximally fifth metatarsal uh, bone, high medial arch, right? So, so we know that some mor the morphology of the foot, you know, this, the of the fifth metatarsal contributes to this uh, Jones fracture. But with that, where do we go? 
So there's no articles regard after that, you know, doing orthotics, you know, to prevent that, but there's no article I could find about orthotics. I'll talk about it in relation a bit. But for the past couple of years, you know, like orthobiologic augmentation, you know, there are a few papers on this. Um, they, uh, this paper, I, I, I quote this paper because this is a huge number of, you know, like uh, patient systemic review, meta-analysis of 780 fractures. Uh, what they, they, they looked into it, they looked into the fusion rates. Most of, mostly the return to play and the time to return to play. These are the main things. But their secondary outcome was union, non-union, and refracture, and all those things. They um, they concluded that biological augmentation fixation of this Jones fracture resulted in higher union rate, but the return to play and the time to return to play were the same. So the, this this X-ray is, is one of the uh, 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 NFL players, you know, like who had biological augmentation through the season. Um, he was fixed with the with the screw, still delayed union, and you see the hardware start to a little bit bend, and you're worried about it, and then did the bone marrow aspirate, PRP, and then and then he got through the season. Um, so this study, you know, like this is the this is the way they they got uh, uh, through the uh, analysis and got about 26 uh, papers. Um, this is the score, and 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 I'm sorry, this is a very little bit busy score, but you know, like busy slide. But uh, this is the forest plot uh, way where they um, plotted that you know that who was who has biological biologic biological augment had the biological augment, who did not. Same thing. So what they found was that you know, like uh, the union rate was reasonably good, better but return to play and the time to return to play are pretty much the same. So biological augment, you know, like uh, they concluded that it, it, it's becoming increasingly common. Anecdotally, we know that, you know, they, we do it, but in the literature, um, there's not much to talk about this uh, biological augmentation in the primary fixation part. Um, there is no current evidence um, in the literature to recommend this uh, biological augmentation when you do a primary fixation for the Jones fracture, but uh, in future, maybe. So going through all this for the past three years literature, what has changed? There's no role for our non-operative management. You know, everybody, you know, high level athletes, our athletes, we fix them, get them back to the, or, or get to the activity what they were before. Implants have not changed much. It's pretty much the you know solid screw or you know like uh, cantilever screw. Um, augment. There's no direction where to go with the augment. So you know if, if you are comfortable doing it, you do it. Return to play is pretty much the same whether you do the augment or not. Uh, it's it's roughly about eight to twelve weeks. The average is about eleven weeks depending upon the 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 sports what what they play. Failure rates pretty much the same, roughly about sixty to twenty percent. And prevention, you know, most of us, you know, we do do orthotics when we sue the when we see them, the foot, you know, like it has a long metatarsal, cavus foot, high arches, they are prone for, you know, like Jones fracture. We still do, a, do orthotics trying to, to prevent them. Does it really prevent them? We don't know. So there's so just that I conclude there's no major changes for the past uh, several years in this in the treatment of Jones fracture in high-level athletes. Um, however, you know, it's important to note that medical knowledge and practice are consistently evolving. New research may emerge in the future that could impact the treatment of Jones fracture in high-level athlete. Thank you. Happy to answer. Any questions? So, the thing is, you know, like, um, of course, you know, you need to get a CT scan to see, eva you know, evaluate how much of, you know, union you have before they let them play. But, but on an average, they see union around, around 10 to 12 weeks. 
you know, without a CT scan, it's hard to evaluate. As you said, you know, it's hard to evaluate the union rate. There's a kind of rate uh, that time. Right. They did some. They did some CT scans. It's, just, it's not a big study, but they do some CT scans with uh, with a uh, PRP bone marrow aspirate, and you know, like uh, showed the right. But not, uh, not in the, uh, not, not, yeah, exactly. But it's not a big cohort, you know, but um, for the, for the augment. The answer that, among the sports that I think. That's why return to play is always tricky to gauge in these because there's so many different criteria for that. And yeah, it's one of those, it's so different than like a navicular or something, or we'll say a lot of times people will say, yeah, okay, this is career altering, not career threatening. You know, we can, you can fix it like a bunch of times. I mean, you keep fixing it. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, thank you very much. So next, next we have uh, Dr. Caroline Tippett, who's our most recent addition. She joined us back in the end of August, beginning of September after graduating from the uh, Badger residency in Roanoke. So we've got a lot of ties with her and our residents have worked with her there. Um, and she's been really wonderful. She's really implementing a lot of new improvements in our, in our limb salvage program, or basically creating one for uh, something we've really been deficient in, in a lot, for a long time. And, and she's doing a lot of great work and made a lot of progress and really it seemed, it's a pretty short time. So she's gonna talk to us a little bit about what some of the work she's doing with some of the you know other parts of the health system and then some other updates on diabetic food stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, y'all. I'm Caroline Tippett. I got to meet a few of you last night, uh, but for those of you I don't know, it's, it's nice to see you all. And thanks for listening. I wanted to thank the department for hiring me and welcoming me and my specialty with open arms. Uh, you all have really made UVA feel like home in a short amount of time, and I'm forever grateful for that. I'm going to talk about the diabetic foot. This is really far topic from your sports and joints worlds, but uh, I hope I can make it interesting for you. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I convince you. I can convince you I'm not a total weirdo for enjoying taking care of this population. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so I, oops, let's see, green button. I don't have any disclosures. I'll give you a ton of statistics, just bear with me. It's, it's for a reason here. Um, but diabetes is a public health crisis. 37 million people in the United States are diagnosed with diabetes, and that's 11% of our population. I love this chart because um, it was made in the year 2000, and at that time, they had predicted in 2023, we would only have about 20 million people in the United States with diabetes. And that just shows you how much we were underestimating the exponential increase in the prevalence of this disease. It's the seventh leading cause of death, and there's about 600,000 deaths per year. Is this my updated talk? Yeah, can you? How do I go back? Okay. Yeah, I don't think this is the updated talk. Can we just make sure? Hey, you think she wear makes a big difference in that? Things that alter and flexible or rigid? Probably not. I think there's a lot. All right, we're just going to roll with it. Uh, so 15% um, of patients with diabetes will develop a foot ulcer each year. And this is mostly because of the neuropathy caused by hyperglycemia. It causes a motor, sensory, and autonomic neuropathy, which contributes to biomechanical abnormalities in the development of these ulcers. 6% of these patients are hospitalized each year. And in fact, foot infection accounts for 25% of the hospitalizations related to diabetes, and that's more than any other diabetic complication. We know that 84% of major lower extremity amputations are preceded by ulceration. 
and that the five-year mortality rate after a non-traumatic baloney amputation is listed anywhere from 40 to 82 percent, depending on which literature you read. And uh, this is quite high and actually rivals some of the five-year mortality rates for the common cancers. Uh, but we don't have fundraisers or marathons to raise awareness or education for prevention of this disease, even though um, the outcomes for this population are just as daunting. The United States is the number one spender on diabetic foot-related complications and diabetes in general. In 2021, we spent $379 billion on diabetes, and uh, that surpasses China by almost double. Um, the per capita of medical expenditure for a patient with diabetes is over double that of a patient without diabetes. And these patients can't work. It reduces productivity. We have 14 million workdays lost, which uh, also impacts our economy. Specifically, we spend $33 billion each year on ulcers. The average cost per ulcer episode is $13,000, and this just increases with wound depth. We know that the inpatient length of stay is the majority of this overall cost and that diabetic foot ulcer patients have a 50% longer length of stay than those without an ulcer. So there's been a big push in the United States for implement, implementation of a multidisciplinary approach for these patients uh, in large hospital systems. And there's been several studies that demonstrate these improved outcomes. Uh, they lead to a shorter time to wound healing, decreases in major limb amputation, decreased healthcare costs, and shorter hospital lengths of stay. Uh, the key players uh, in these teams are um, the vascular and orthopedics department. Um, and this kind of trickles out into the uh, specialties on the inpatient side that help manage these patients. It starts with the emergency room physicians who triage these patients and get them admitted to the hospital, the medicine team who uh, admits the patient and manages their medical, multiple medical comorbidities, the plastic surgery team who helps us cover these large soft tissue defects and infectious disease teams uh, who manage the long-term antibiotic plan for these patients. And then we have to look at the outpatient approach um, in the multidisciplinary team. And that's really the specialties that focus on prevention and optimization of health of these patients. And um, something that I think is really special about our orthopedic center, like others mentioned yesterday, is we have this wonderful prosthetics and orthotics department downstairs. I can write for uh, the specific offloading device that I wish, know the patient will go downstairs, be appropriately sized and fitted, and feel confident um, that they leave this building uh, with the appropriate device. And this is a huge satisfier for me and my patients. Um, secondly, we have a social worker in the building uh, during all clinic hours, and her name's Martha. And Martha is probably tired of me because my patients have huge social disparities, and I use her all the time um, for things like managing home health, getting these dressings to patients at home, making sure they have rides to their appointments, and also even getting them psychological services after amputation. To date, at the University of Virginia, we have not had a multidisciplinary team approach, um, and so we are trying to implement that, and we have actually called this the walk-on service. Um, it's kind of a lame name, but uh, it reminds us of our ultimate goal that we want to keep these patients walking. Um, it stands for Working Alliance for Limb Conservation. And me and my vascular colleague, her name's Libby Weaver. She's amazing. Uh, she is a new hire as well. We're really spearheading this. And our goals are to improve outcomes and decrease resource utilization to, de to develop a database to assess our quality improvements and eventually to create a multidisciplinary educational curriculum for the trainees. We are putting this out in phases. We're currently in phase one, where we're gonna implement the service in the inpatient setting uh, for the appropriate triage of these foot wounds. Um, this really focuses on educating those inpatient players, the emergency department, um, on who to call whenever uh, these wounds come in the emergency room. 
We're also going to focus on weekly multi-specialty rounds. We've already started this between me and the vascular service, and this improves communication and decreases these patients' length of stay. We're also uh, creating a database to trend all of our outcomes and publish. And this is just an example of that uh, triage protocol. I won't go into it into detail, but um, the triage from the emergency room. Phase two is a walk-on wound care center where we'll have a centralized space for these patients and um, have specialized wound care nurses and wound care products and hopefully share the space with the vascular service so they can have their routine surveillance after revascularizations in the same appointment. Uh, phase three is the development of the education service for the residents and trainees and further research initiatives. So the second half of my talk, I wanted to transition into one of my favorite topics. I think it's really underutilized and underrecognized, and that's surgical offloading procedures to heal these diabetic foot ulcers. Traditionally, we rely on conservative methods, the surgical shoe, the total contact cast, the cam boot, um, to heal these, and those do work, but when they don't work uh, or when the wound recurs, uh, something special about foot and ankle specialists is that we can recognize these underlying biomechanical abnormalities and do surgery on them to fix them and have the wound heal. So these procedures are mostly focused on the non-ischemic, non-infected wounds, um, and we'll just keep that in mind. And the goal is to, uh, instead of having the patient walking in with this, we can't save this. We're pushed to amputation at this point. Uh, we want to catch the patient with the superficial wound, the patient with the pre-ulcerative callus, and figure out why they continue to recur and how we can prevent them from getting worse before the patient comes into the emergency room septic with this, where we're forced to perform a transmetatarsal amputation, in this case on the right, um, which we know has a 50% healing rate and often leads to a major amputation. So I'm going to go over a few of the procedures um, that are common in my practice. They're easy to do. You can do them in the office. You can do them under MAC with local minimal clearance needed um, for this. And uh, I'll just share uh, some of my favorites. So a very common one is the distal tip of the toe ulcer. This is caused by hammer toes or claw toes. And we really want to catch this when the deformity is still flexible. Uh, so we can release the flexor digitorum longus tendon, allow the ulcer to heal and prevent amputation. There's been numerous studies on this, but this was a systematic review that uh, showed a 97% healing rate at 30 days after the in-office flexor tenotomy, a low recurrence rate, and a low complication rate. And this is a pictorial. You can use a 15-blade, and 11-blade, whatever you choose. Even some people use an 18-gauge needle um, and release that tendon. Uh, I guess something I could add to Beamer's lecture is Maybe in your first year, start taking pictures of the cases you do so you can actually add them to your talks. But this was uh, from our residency. This is an old picture. Um, I don't have a picture of the original wound, but this is week one and two after the flexor tenotomy. You can see the toe is straight, the wound is healed, and we just prevented amputation of this lady. Um, a second one that is far too common in our population is the plantar Alex interphalangeal joint ulcer. This is caused by restricted range of motion of the first MTP joint, uh, hallux limitus or hallux rigidus, we call this in the foot world. Uh, you resect a third of the base of the proximal phalanx, and this decompresses the joint and allows for offloading of the IP joint, and the wound typically heals in a few weeks. Um, I borrowed these pictures from this paper. This was actually recently published in Foot and Ankle International. I was excited to see this, um, the outcomes of the Keller arthroplasty and these wounds. Um, you make a simple dorsal approach, expose the MTP joint, rinse it out, sew it up, that's it. Um, and this decompresses the joint enough to allow for offloading and subsequent healing of that IP ulcer. And just to reiterate, you don't even have to do anything to the ulcer besides let it sit. 
And after a few short weeks, um, you can see the wound is healed and there's mineral, minimal structural deformities on the foot. Another is the plantar lesser metatarsal head ulcer. This is caused by an abnormal metatarsal parabola or a prominent metatarsal or equinus deformity and sometimes a combination of both. And the treatment is Achilles tendon lengthening or gastroc recession, a metatarsal heterosection, or there's been a big push uh, lately for floating metatarsal head osteotomies through a minimally invasive approach using a burr. Uh, the equinus deformity we know is a huge deformant force on the forefoot and the midfoot. And we can use a hope tri triple hemisection to lengthen the tendon. Uh, some surgical pearls here are just to space the incision out as far as you can, um, usually three to four centimeters to decrease the rate of rupture or over lengthening, which of course leads to detrimental calcaneal gait. Um, this is one of my patients. I took this picture. Uh, this was a 35 year old neuropathic diabetic guy. He's now controlled. Um, he's had this wound for a year, been to multiple different specialties, um, hospitalized and at UVA for consideration for amputation. And um, I did a Achilles tendon lengthening, and this is him at six weeks. Now the wound is healed, and I don't have a long-term outcome yet, obviously, but I look forward to seeing how he does, and it surely has uh, improved his quality of life. Uh, another simple procedure is a metatarsal head resection. I usually just judge this clinically if, they, if I can feel the metatarsal head is prominent and that's where the wound is, I'll cut the metatarsal head out. This is another one of my patients had this ulcer for years. It's stable, but just failed conservative, all floating, uh, made a simple tiny dorsal incision, took out the met heads of the second and third metatarsals, and this is her healed at four weeks. The fifth metatarsal head ulcer, um, that's a similar indication for a met head resection, but also in patients who have a flexible varus deformity of the forefoot and a contracted tibant tendon, you can consider a tibialis anterior tendon lengthening, a small incision over the tendon, perform a Z lengthening, sew it back together. And uh, you can see here that after uh, reducing this force, this lateral fifth met head ulcer is healed after years of being open. So that's all I have. Um, thank you for listening to my fragmented talk that wasn't updated. And uh, do you guys have any questions? This is an enormous patient population that I think, you know, we didn't have a very coordinated care uh, process for providing care. And now that you're here and the effort you are making with Dr. Weaver, I think it'll really improve the care, but also reduce you know, hospital stay and hopefully reduce uh, trips to the OR and so forth because of good appropriate care. That's the goal. Could you, you accept the medicine consult and get a bone culture? <laughs> <laughs> I every time I do an amputation, I send bone pathology and bone culture because I'm so tired of the calls. Um, but uh, Usually only if I'm in the OR. I don't do it at bedside or take them just for a bone culture. I tell them to treat empirically if there's no indication for resection of bone or debridement in the operating room. Maybe like a calcaneus or something. Yeah. Like they love to consult for like a fifth toe biopsy. It's like, well, we'll just take it off. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.